and I'm putting the aggression solidly in the, on the heads and hands of the Romans. But this first aggression gave Europe the means of feeding itself and to expand for the first time beyond its shores and sustain itself. Was it, profit the motive for slavery? Profit was the motive for slavery and, 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 and a form of uh, colonialism. Now, profit and bread. See, capitalism in the present sense didn't exist then, although the profit motive was a part of man's uh, 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 psychological uh, makeup. But the justification for the Romans being was that they were endowed by certain traits, in spite of the fact that once they destroyed Carthage, they could not even build it back the same way because they didn't have those master architects that the Carthaginians, uh, that the Carthaginians had. Now, Rome would sustain itself in this part of the world, and Roman taxation ultimately would force the Africans and the Asians to question old gods and look for new gods. This questioning, this wondering whether their gods had deserted them would make them look into their folklore, their literature, and bring forth the beginnings, the formal beginnings of a religion that we might know, later know as, as Christianity. Not that the religion was new, but that particular formation of the ideas of the religion was new. All right. Let's pause here, Professor Clark, and we'll continue with the African presence in the so-called New World right after this. As far as the African presence in this hemisphere, was the, that premise for coming here um, economic or what? Curiosity or what? The initial um, movement here was an accident. How'd that um, happen? This happened, uh, first of all, I must give a dating um, schema because there was not just a single visit. There were several, at least half a dozen visits of which we have, for which we have evidence. The very earliest is one um, that involves the people known as the Almec in America um, between 948 and 680 BC. We do know a date because we found, they found a ceremonial platform, a wooden platform in the Gulf of Mexico where the Americans worshipped. They were able to carbon date it. They found um, four of a dozen stone heads with African features rooted in the wood of this carbon dated platform and they were able to give it the dating of 814 plus or minus 134 BC. Now that is a very interesting date indeed because that is a time when something very unusual was happening in the old world in Africa. A war was going on, both a hot and cold war which lasted a very long time between the, the powers of Asia under the Assyrians and the Egypto-Nubians. I say Egypto-Nubian because Nubian Egypt were, were linked in that period, very strongly linked in fact, because the Nubians had, um, from about the 22nd dynasty, they were involved with Libyan powers in um, Middle Egypt, and then they moved up and took control of Egypt from the Mediterranean right down to Khartoum and beyond. And in this period, the military and commercial navies were moving west of the Mediterranean towards the Atlantic. They normally were not involved in the Atlantic. The Egyptian navies and the Phoenicians, who were very much involved with Egyptians, um, carried a lot of trade into the Pacific. We even have Egyptian hieroglyphs from in early Hawaii. But in this period, the Asiatic routes, sea routes, were blocked by the Asiatics. Yes. They blocked off the Egyptian sea routes. As a consequence, a great deal of the metal trade the search for... But how would you get from the Mediterranean to the Pacific, though? Um, no, no. They, they had um, the Red Sea and other routes, and they, ha they went into the Indian Ocean and various oh, things. Oh, I see. Okay, right. so they, they had trading. Egypt had trading in other parts of the world. But in this particular period, while they had trade in the Western Mediterranean, this particular period became tremendously intensified. We even have evidence around 800 B.C. of Phoenician ships up in the, near the British Isles, they're trading in tin. Tin was critical to Egypt because that was the Bronze Age and tin 
and copper were critical to, to the making of bronze. And you have a lot of movement in that area west of the Mediterranean. Now, there seems to have been an accident involving at least seven ships. The, American, the Native Americans record black-skinned people coming in seven wooden caves on the water from the east. And they do record this. And lots of people are not you aware mean they of got it. lost at sea or they got they lost at sea. All so-called discoveries of America were initially accidents. Columbus had no intention of coming here. He got lost at sea. He was going um, towards India. As he thought, he struck out to the latitude of Japan hoping to land in India. Even in the case of 1500 where Alvarez Cabral came to South America, he had no intention of coming here. <laughs> he was lost at sea. Is it not true, though, that Africans, um, in their uh, mathematical uh, endeavors, concluded that the world was round and that there was land beyond the horizon? They concluded and that it was that not an accident that they came to this hemisphere. They concluded that the world was round. Just as much, much later, Columbus concluded that the world was round. But knowing that so the world is... So does that imply, then, that... No, it does not. No? It does not. Knowing that the world is round does not imply a land mass here. That is the reason why Columbus, when he landed here, thought he was in Asia. Because you would not know where the landmass is. This could have been Asia. That's why, in fact, it was called India. It wasn't called America. But uh, uh, just to pin you a little bit uh, down to this, was the African lost at sea, the African mariner lost at sea, Initially, and initially. was blown across the Atlantic? Yes. Or did he, he or she set out deliberately? No, he did not set out deliberately in this voyage. There are voyages in which the Africans set out deliberately to come to America. We know of two such voyages. We know, for example, in the case of the Mandu Mandingo in 1310 and 1311, where the Africans were convinced there was a landmass in the south and set out deliberately. A whole fleet was fitted out for that. And when that fleet did not return, one of their kings, Abu Bakari II, actually set out as a commander of the fleet and uh, moved into this area. We also have evidence in the late pre-Columbian, that is around 1450, AD, we have evidence where Africans not only deliberately came, but came back. And we have African things found in America, as well as American things found in Africa as evidence of a trading going on in that time. What was the nature of the African um, uh, contact with the people who were indigenous to the land here? Well, it, depending, it depends on the period. In the, in the case of the Olmec period, which is the pre-Christian period, which is the the, the 948 to 68 to BC, we have evidence that some very extraordinary things begin to happen that coincide with the stone heads of, uh, with African features, mm -hmm. uh, which are found in the Gulf of Mexico at the, the terminus of currents coming from Africa. Now, one very important thing to understand is that there are three major currents that take things from Africa. They are so powerful, these currents that it's like a gravitational field. The oceanic you cannot, Yes, you cannot escape coming to America once you are caught 100 miles off the African coast and enter either the, the um, current off the Cape Verde, off the Senegambia coast, or off the southern coast of Africa. You have to come here unless you're caught by the fish. <laughs> it, it, it's inevitable. And in fact, I do remember uh, when I was a boy, when I was about 11 years old, I lived um, most of my early boyhood was spent on a river, the Essequibo River, which opens out onto the Atlantic. And Where I was is that? Caught, what country this, is This that? is in South America, Guyana. Yes. I was caught in one of the currents that the Africans call a river in the middle of the sea. It's quite different from normal currents. You, if you're caught in a normal current, you could die beneath the current. But in this current, it is like a whole new river pulling you out of the river. And I screamed my head off because I was seven miles from coast. I'd fallen asleep on a raft. I spent lots of times <laughs> in the rivers and nobody could hear me because I was too far until the current which was going, taking me into the Atlantic came across a place called Keao Island and that was close to shore as the current moved off. And you were on your way home. Yes. <laughs> or back home. Well, the fish would have got me in this particular case. Well, I'm one afraid. never knows. But I was picked up by a speedboat. But this has happened several times from Africa. We found several things in the American world that are African. I want specifically to touch on the Olmec, because there well, they have found peaceful. Uh, here in this hemisphere. <laughs> yes, with the exception, we have one instance where we have battles between the Africans and the Americans off Quarikua 
where they found that the Africans were fighting. They had a settlement and they were fighting with Native Americans.